Good evening. I'm Alan Altshuler, professor here at the Kennedy School. And on behalf of the Institute of Politics and seven co-sponsoring student organizations, if I listed them all, we'd uh, interfere too much with the governor's talk, but they have been plastered on posters all over campus recently. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the ARCO Forum this evening. Uh, our speaker this evening, Governor Pedro Rosseo, is a physician by training. He was president of the class of 1970 at Yale Medical School and subsequently completed his training in general and pediatric surgery here at Harvard, in the Harvard Hospital System. From 1976 to 1985, back in Puerto Rico, he both practiced and taught pediatric surgery. In 1985, this conventional medical career was interrupted when he accepted appointment as Director of Health for the city of San Juan. Uh, three years later, somehow he had caught the political bug while in this office, and he plunged into elective politics, nearly defeating Puerto Rico's incumbent delegate to the U.S. Congress. In 1991, he became chair of the New Progressive Party, which favors statehood for Puerto Rico. And under its banner, he was elected governor in 1992. Four years later, in 1996, he was re-elected in the greatest landslide in 32 years. Uh, I've been reading and hearing from him over dinner about the accomplishments that made this possible, but I'm going to leave it to him to tell you about them. He does a much better job than I could do in that. Governor Rosseo is currently president of the Council of State Governments, chair of the Democratic Governors Association, and chairman of the Southern Governors Association. This would be a remarkable combination for anyone, particularly since his party is not the Democratic Party and he's chairman of the Democratic Governors Association. Uh, but considering that Puerto Rico is not a state, it's an unprecedented accomplishment. Let me note finally that Governor Rosseo is not just a physician, not just a political leader. He is also, or at least he has been, a prominent sportsman. In college at Notre Dame, he was a nationally ranked tennis player and captain of the team, and he is a five-time Puerto Rico men's single champion. He says now he doesn't play with his family because they could beat him, but we're not sure we believe that. Uh, more recently, he has headed both the Puerto Rico and Caribbean Tennis Associations and served on the executive committee of the U.S. Tennis Association. With very great pleasure, let me present Governor Pedro Rosseo. Thank you very much, Professor Altshuler, for those very uh, generous words, and uh, thank you for not giving the dates on the uh, tennis history here. I think uh, none of us want to go into uh, ancient history at this uh, point of the night. But thank you also to the friends and sponsors of this forum, the faculty, the students, the staff, and supporters of the Institute of Politics at Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government. Special guests, members of the news media, ladies and gentlemen, friends, all. How many times, how many thousands of times has a scene like this unfolded? A chilly night in Cambridge, a meeting room at Harvard, a group of people whose common interests have brought them together to listen to a speaker who has traveled to Massachusetts from some distant location. For me, and I hope for you, this is an important occasion. And yet, as I commence the solitary task of writing down the thoughts that I would share with you this evening, I had to ask myself whether our forum dialogue tonight could possibly have any lasting impact. I had to wonder if this forum, this lecture, could possibly stand out and somehow be remembered. When so many legendary figures have uttered so many immortal words over so many hundreds of years at so many critical moments on this world-renowned campus. So it was, as I commenced the solitary task of composing this address, that the lyrics to a song kept running through my head, a song by the Beatles, one of their many uniquely wonderful songs, a song about an obscure spinster 
Eleanor Rigby, who dies and is buried alone with her name. Referring to preparations for Ms. Rigby's bleak funeral at a deserted cemetery, the Beatles painted a poignant portrait of Father Mackenzie writing the words to a sermon no one will hear. It was those lyrics that made the connection for me between this encounter at Harvard and a classic work by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. While reflecting on those lyrics, I realized that on this chilly night in Cambridge, we would be looking back over 100 años de soledad, 100 years of solitude. More than four centuries after Christopher Columbus laid claim to it on behalf of their royal majesties, Ferdinand and Isabella, the Spanish colony of Puerto Rico was struggling gamely for subsistence and engulfed in obscurity. When very suddenly, a hundred years ago this past Sunday, the United States battleship Maine exploded in the harbor at Havana, Cuba. Three days later, in Puerto Rico's capital city of San Juan, a child was born. That child, Luis Munoz Marin, would grow up to become not only the most powerful politician in the history of Puerto Rico, but also one of the most influential statesmen in the inter-American stage in the entire tumultuous 20th century. A remarkable coincidence, yes. <clears throat> Two days ago was the centennial of the catastrophe that triggered the conflict which brought Puerto Rico under United States control. And tomorrow, we celebrate in Puerto Rico the centennial of the birth of the man who made history as our first popularly elected governor, Luis Munoz Marin. But amazingly, the coincidence doesn't stop there. Today, February 17th, we celebrate the birthday of a man who is still making history at the age of 94. Don Luis Ferre, engineer, industrialist, patron of the arts. Don Luis Ferre, who participated in drafting the Constitution of Puerto Rico nearly 50 years ago, who 31 years ago founded the political party that has won most of our elections ever since. Don Luis Ferre, a former member of our House of Representatives, a former president of our Senate, a former governor of Puerto Rico, and a recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom for his lifetime of loyalty and service to the United States of America. For most of this century, Luis Ferre has been at the forefront of a crusade, crusade that many dismissed as quixotic. It is he who symbolizes and embodies the faith and determination and persistence of a crusade for equality, which at the dawn of a new millennium, I am confident will culminate in Puerto Rico's admission to the Union as America's 51st state. After 100 years of solitude, Puerto Rico is at last approaching a date with destiny. During this century, the century of stewardship over Puerto Rico, Uncle Sam has often been a clumsy patron. His interest and his attention span have fluctuated wildly. Overall, Uncle Sam has been infinitely more supportive of our aspiration as a people than Mother Spain ever was. But that, be as it may, however, with the centennial of the Spanish-American War now upon us, the people of Puerto Rico do remain disenfranchised stepchildren within the great American family. Only now and then, we are unconditionally anointed as peers only now and then, such as when there is blood to be shed in the national defense. Throughout this century, Puerto Ricans have sustained combat casualties in America's war in numbers far exceeding our share of the population. When there is blood to be sh shed, then we're abruptly liberated from the stepchild obscurity and are thrust into the thick of the conflict. And sadly, this sort of thing has been going on for so long, decade after decade after decade, that any governor of Puerto Rico could perhaps be forgiven if he or she were tempted to conclude that one more speech on the topic could hardly make much of a difference. 
But I am an optimist by nature. And in 1998, I have solid grounds for optimism. I would never have considered accepting the gracious invitation of this prestigious institute if I did not truly believe that a date with destiny is indeed finally imminent for the 3.8 million people of Puerto Rico. The issues are complex. The historical baggage is indeed heavy. Opinions on the, on the subject are many, varied, and passionately held. My personal views are no secret. Indeed, I have already told you what I am convinced our destiny ought to be. However, after putting myself in the shoes of the Beatles' father Mackenzie, I have emerged from prayerful solitude and come to a serene conclusion. I have come to the conclusion that the most useful contribution I can make at the John F. Kennedy School of Government is to resist the temptation to convert this forum into the setting for a single-minded soliloquy on the superiority of statehood. My goal tonight is to try to speak for every Puerto Rican with respect to our collective aspiration to forge a final democratic solution to the centuries-old quandary surrounding Puerto Rico's political indefinition. Because I truly believe that Puerto Rico's date with destiny is imminent, I want to examine with you the tapestry upon which that destiny is being woven. On countless of looms, in countless venues, even as you and I discuss it among ourselves. Currently, the most visible of those many venues is Washington, D.C. There, the federal government is making unprecedented strides towards surmounting a century of stalemate. For the first time, the United States Congress is moving in the direction of genuinely coming to grips with the practical realities of Puerto Rico self-determination process. Under the U.S. Constitution, that process is the sole province of Congress. The power and authority for determining Puerto Rico's political status is vested totally in Congress. From 1898 forward, Congress has repeatedly finessed the issue. It has done so in numerous ways, dating all the way back to 1900. In that year, when we held our first election under the American sovereignty, both of Puerto Rico's principal political parties clamored for U.S. statehood. But when their petitions reached the halls of power in our nation's capital, they were met only with mumbled platitudes of mañana. The congressional finesse achieved its zenith or its nadir at the height of the Cold War in 1952, when Puerto Rico was proclaimed to be a commonwealth, defined in Spanish as an Estado Libre Asociado, literally a free associated state. The so-called Commonwealth of Puerto Rico was purely and simply a sham, a diplomatic public relations gimmick that provided Uncle Sam with a fig leaf for escaping overt embarrassment whenever self-determination issues arose in the United Nations. No less an authority than the Honorable Jose Trias Monge declared last, last month that it is, and let me quote, undeniable and lamentable, unquote, that Puerto Rico remains under Commonwealth status in a colonial condition. And you may ask, who is Jose Trias Monges? He is a founding father of the Commonwealth status, who was instrumental in fabricating it as one of the most esteemed members of the Constitutional Convention that drafted the blueprint for Commonwealth, which Congress ratified in 1952. Jose Trias Monge served in a pro-Commonwealth administration as Puerto Rico's Attorney General. Jose Trias Monge was appointed by a pro-Commonwealth governor and confirmed by a pro-Commonwealth Senate to serve as Chief Justice of the Puerto Rico Supreme Court. But as of July 25th, as that date of July 25th, 1998, centennial of the United States invasion of Puerto Rico draws ever closer, Trias Monge is best known now as the author of a recently published book, a book entitled 
the trials of the oldest colony in the world. Jose Trias Monge has seen the light, and more importantly, so has Congress. The old Vanessa Rooney is on the way out. Congressman Don Young of Alaska chairs the U.S. House Committee that exercises jurisdiction over territorial affairs. His Committee on Resources is earnestly engaged in a rigorously unsentimental assessment of America's complicated and frequently contradictory relationships with its far-flung array of insular possessions. Ever since, since he became Resources Committee Chairman in 1995, Congressman Young has been working on legislation that would offer the voters of Puerto Rico an opportunity to express their preference from among a clearly defined set of political status options. He's held lengthy hearings in Washington. He's held lengthy hearings in Puerto Rico. Congressman Young's purpose is to initiate an orderly process that will end our status dilemma once and for all. Now awaiting a vote by the full House of Representatives is a legislative measure that has been come to be known as the Young Bill, or H.R. 856. The bill has close to 100 co-sponsors from both political parties. Republican Speaker Newt Gingrich is one of those co-sponsors. So is Democratic House Minority Leader Richard Gephardt. The ranking Democrat on Republican Chairman Young's committee, Congressman George Miller of California, likewise supports the bill. And President Clinton is equally committed to the proposition that Puerto Rico should be the site of a political status referendum this centennial year. I'm fully confident that H.R. 856, the United States Puerto Rico Political Status Act, will be brought to the House floor within the next few weeks. The enactment of H.R. 856 would constitute the most appropriate and constructive step that the federal government could take to mark the centennial of U.S. sovereignty over Puerto Rico. But whatever, whatever transpires in 1998, a precedent is being established and a trend is becoming apparent. Official Washington is finally giving serious attention to the unfinished business that has surfaced as the legacy of the controversial doctrine known as Manifest Destiny. <clears throat> the very doctrine which played such a pivotal role in spawning the so-called splendid little war that planted the stars and stripes on Puerto Rican soil 100 years ago. So this is one major reason why I firmly believe that our date with destiny is indeed imminent. Before we move on, let me note in passing that it is impossible to overemphasize the intrinsic merit of the Young Bill statesman's like approach to the self-determination process. Puerto Rico has been a political entity for approximately five centuries. In all that time, it has never ever been a sovereignty, sovereign entity, never ever. As a body politics, Puerto Rico is burdened with five centuries of inertia. Few informers or few informed observers would quarrel with former Chief Justice Trias Monge's assertion that Puerto Rico is the oldest colony in the world. The impact of the colonial inertia has again and again been manifested in the following manner. Colonial inertia effectively stymies the evolution of any consensus among the Puerto Rican people concerning a permanent solution to our status dilemma. Again and again, inertia has fomented indecision. And invariably, that inertia has been perpetuated and exacerbated by doubt and uncertainty over what exactly would be the terms under which a permanent status solution would be implemented. The beauty of the Young Bill is that it establishes an orderly, logical, methodology for the approval and implementation of an informed transition leading to a permanent solution. Under the procedure set forth in H.R. 856, the people of Puerto Rico would possess at every juncture, at every juncture in that transitional process, the indispensable elements of judgment that we have always lacked in the past. 
This time, we would know exactly what we were being invited to ratify or to reject. It is this unmistakable clarity, this unambiguous articulation of precisely what is at stake that makes the Young Bill so uniquely viable. The United States Puerto Rico Political Status Act starts from a premise that is indisputably and irrefutably valid. It begins with the premise that the concept of self-determination is inseparable from the concept of sovereignty. Defenders of the status quo strenuously object to the Young Bill. They call it a statehood bill. They object before, because the bill explicitly acknowledges that the status quo, our so-called commonwealth status, is not and can never be a sovereign option. The bill, at my request incidentally, does include the status quo as an option on the referendum ballot. But the bill candidly and honestly concedes that a referendum victory for the status quo would constitute a defeat for, for self-determination. Accordingly, it describes such an outcome as inconclusive and directs that under such circumstances, there shall be further referenda at least once every 10 years until such time as the majority of the Puerto Rican electorate expresses a preference for either shared sovereignty through statehood or separate sovereignty as an independent republic. In other words, the Young Bill leaves the door wide open for Puerto Ricans to exercise true self-determination, while it simultaneously goes the extra mile by agreeing to respect the will of our people, even if we do not immediately choose a true self-determination alternative. Nothing could be more fair than that. Nothing could be more reasonable. Nothing could reflect greater patience Nothing could reflect greater goodwill. So in branding H.R. 856 as a statehood bill, the champions of the Commonwealth cause are simply engaged in a disinformation campaign. They are simply endeavoring to distract public attention from the very humiliating position in which they find themselves as persons who insist on opposing the proposition that the people the Puerto Rican electorate should be granted the right to put an end to colonialism in attempting to discredit statehood and to derail the self-determination process, they brazenly assert to anyone who will listen that Puerto Rico will be a welfare state, an economic basket case that would place a permanent intolerable burden on the federal treasury. Well, my friends, that is balderdash. According to a brand new study co-authored by Glenn Jenkins, who is the director of the International Tax Program at Harvard Law School and a fellow at the Harvard Institute for International Development, he and Chairman Thomas Hexner of Hex Incorporated in a work entitled Puerto Rico, the Economic and Fiscal Dimensions, have concluded emphatically, and again, let me quote, from a fiscal perspective, bringing in Puerto Rico as a 51st state would result both a net benefit to the U.S. Treasury and to U.S. citizens living in Puerto Rico. At great length and in great detail, the research demonstrates that the myriad disadvantages of residing in a territory pose an unsurmountable barrier to a people's optimal socioeconomic development. These scholars document their argument with abundant evidence including the observation that the inflation-adjusted economic growth in Hawaii nearly doubled during the first 15 years as a state. In the expert of, of, opinion of Jenkins and Hexner, and I quote again, from the perspective of the American taxpayers and Congress, making Puerto Rico a state would actually cost the federal government less on the basis of present value and additional savings from increased tax revenues driven by, by faster economic growth. The authors go on to say that if Puerto Rico had been a state in 1995, the U.S. Treasury would have saved at least $2.1 billion. So the welfare state smear is as specious 
as it is pernicious. Unfortunately, though, desperate diehards of disenfranchisement have other arrows in their quiver. It seems they will stop at nothing to sully the image of their own people. Along with their welfare state rhetoric, they have been rolling out a shopworn arsenal of bombastic cliches. They portray a state of Puerto Rico as an American Quebec, that is a hotbed of resentment, cultural hostility, alienation, and endless trouble. In making that case, these status quo ideologues conveniently ignore a whole host of pertinent facts. Quebec is Canada's largest province, home to one-fourth of Canada's population and the site of its second biggest city. Puerto Rico in both size and population is comparable to Connecticut. What a difference. The French-speaking people of Quebec fell under the domination of English speakers because they lost the war. That painful experience has never been forgotten. Nearly half of Quebec's population advocates separation from Canada. Puerto Ricans, by contrast, welcomed the change of sovereignty that occurred in 1898. Independence sentiment is minimal, less than 5%. And thus, far from clinging to the islands as a bastion against English, so many of us have moved to the mainland that almost as many Puerto Ricans reside in the 50 states as reside in Puerto Rico itself. Three mainland Puerto Ricans hold seats in Congress. A Puerto Rican is chief judge of the First Circuit of U.S. Court of Appeals here in Boston. Numerous Puerto Ricans have been generals or admirals in the U.S. Armed Forces. A Puerto Rican woman is a member of the President's Cabinet as head of the Small Business Administration. Another Puerto Rican woman serves on the Federal Communications Commission, and a third was recently the nation's doctors, the Surgeon General of the United States. Puerto Ricans have been United States citizens by birth since 1917. Spanish-speaking United States citizens who unhesitatingly accept the fact that most of their fellow citizens speak only English. Statehood won't change that. If Puerto Rico's Spanish vernacular hasn't been a problem for the past century, and indeed it hasn't, then it won't be a problem under statehood either. And besides, the debate in Quebec is about whether to get out of Canada. The debate surrounding U.S. statehood for Puerto Rico is exactly the opposite. So the Quebec analogy simply does not fly. But def desperate ideologues will try anything, so the, anal the analogy is still out there, being exploited to the hilt in a calculated attempt to poison the well of American public opinion. If we in Puerto Rico have been remiss up to now in failing to vigorously debunk these shameful acts of mythological mischief, it is only because we have been too busy back home providing the old adage, or proving the old adage, that actions speak louder than words. Let me illustrate that. Upon my inauguration in 1993, having received an unequivocal mandate from the Puerto Rican electorate, we launched a new beginning that would prepare Puerto Rico for its date with destiny. For the past five years, from top to bottom, stem to stern, we have been revamping and modernizing the Puerto Rican ship of state. From our economic development model, to our tax code, to our education system, our health care system, our judicial system, our public safety apparatus, our infrastructure, from top to bottom, from stem to stern, we have reformed Puerto Rico's government by converting it into a friendly facilitator of individual empowerment and private business expansion. We are aggressively, persistently, and relentlessly creating a climate of self-sufficiency, a self-sufficiency that will permit Puerto Ricans to excel and to triumph in the bilingual, bicultural marketplace that is rapidly encompassing both of our American continents in this exciting age of hemispheric economic integration. We're doing this because it's the right thing to do. 
We're doing it in a way that will ensure that Puerto Rico can progress and prosper under any political status, since our new economic model, unlike its predecessor, is status neutral. We are securely embarked on an exciting voyage of discovery, energized by an unshakable commitment to tomorrow. And thanks to that commitment, never again will ideological status quo advocates be able to sell our people a bill of goods. Never again will they make any headway with ta tactics such as the strident claims to the effect that learning English threatens Puerto Rico's patrimony. We know that bilingualism is a blessing. We know too that it will soon be indispensable. So we the people of Puerto Rico know and understand that we should and we must equip each of our young people with both the ability to communicate in both Spanish and English. This is a Puerto Rico that is forging its own future with confidence, with courage, with creativity. This is a Puerto Rico that is ready and eager for its date with destiny. And as that date draws nearer, its arrival is being accelerated as well by a third powerful phenomenon that must be mentioned before I close. That phenomenon is as fundamental as our nation's very motto, e pluribus unum. In the 21st century, how shall we read that motto? What will it mean when we look at America and utter the phrase, out of many, one? The answer is in this room. The answer is spread all across this campus. The answer is swiftly finding its way into every community in every state. The earth is fast becoming a global village linked by instantaneous communication and a worldwide marketplace. Our America can remain a respected leader in that global village, a strong, prosperous, and just leader if and only if we take full and complete advantage of the unique asset that is the diversity of this nation's population. In the 21st century, equality and opportunity must and shall become more than a matter of principle. In the global economy of the 21st century, equality of opportunity will become a matter of necessity because unless we take a maximum advantage of our diversity, we shall inevitably begin to lose our competitive edge in the international marketplace of product, services, and ideas. Diversity, therefore, is an issue where the idealistic and the pr pragmatic converge. Diversity is indeed an issue where our best instincts and our best interests converge. 10 or 15 years from now, Hispanics will have become the principal subgroup in the United States population. And the timing could not be better. As our nation's entrepreneurs look south to limitless opportunities for profitable interchange and productive partnership with the 400 million consumers of an increasingly democratic, increasingly market-oriented Latin America and the Caribbean. Hispanic Americans will be at the forefront of that mutually beneficial exchange leading the breakthrough and opening the doors to cordial collaboration and better lives for people throughout our hemisphere. Within that context, and contemplating that inevitably imminent scenario, who can doubt that the spotlight is shifting? Who can doubt that Puerto Rico will move out of the shadows and onto center stage, its era as an insular stepchild gone for good? Who can doubt that bilingual, bicultural Puerto Rico will take its place in the hemispheric spotlight as an ideally situated bridge of the Americas? Who can doubt that 500 years of heritage, zealously cherished and faithfully nurtured, will suddenly be perceived in a whole new perspective, no longer quaint, no longer exotic, no longer strange, overnight, the heritage we treasure as patriotic Puerto Ricans is going to be transformed in the minds of Americans from every other background. 
where once our heritage may have been perceived as an obstacle to acceptance, or at best, as a charming tourist attraction, that heritage tomorrow shall be recognized and warmly welcomed as a magnificent resource for American leadership in the global village of a new millennium. My friends, after 100 years of solitude, under a star-spangled banner on which none of the stars could ever be called ours, we, the people of Puerto Rico, are about to make the most of a long overdue date with destiny. And America, all of America, from sea to shining sea, will be richer for it. Thank you very much. May God bless you all. Thank you, Governor, for an extraordinarily thoughtful and forceful statement. Uh, as you know, we take questions, or the Governor will take questions. Uh, from the mics, let me mention, do not touch the mics. If you touch the mics, uh, things don't work very well, no matter how effective you may be otherwise in, uh, in making your point. Uh, please identify yourself by name and affiliation uh, as you begin, and please uh, concentrate on asking questions rather than speeches because this is the governor's night to make speeches and so we reserve that right uh, to him. Sir. Governor, my name have, is... I, let me mention, we only have mics on the ground floor tonight, so if you're in the upper level and you want to ask questions, please come down and get online down here. Yes. Governor, my name is John Carman, second year here at the Kennedy School, also a third year law student. I was very interested in your speech tonight concerning Puerto Rico's possibility for statehood and was particularly interested in your commitment to the application of the Bill of Rights um, to your current administration. It was reported in the LA Times last December that one day after the largest newspaper in Puerto Rico, El Nuevo Diaz, ran a, stories of, or ran a series of investigations critical of uh, your administration, particularly in the forms of fraud and corruption, that a large number of government advertisers uh, pulled their advertisements from the paper, as well as a tax audit was initiated and a government-funded uh, housing project with the Puerto Rican Concrete Company was uh, terminated. I was wondering if you could state whether these allegations are true, and if so, how you feel that that is a legitimate use of state power under the uh, traditional freedoms of the press, which are afforded by the First Amendment. Uh, let me just uh, give you a short answer, and then I'll expand on, on it. Those allegations are totally false. Totally false. The newspaper in question has uh, a series of other enterprises. And the reality is that uh, the newspaper is used as an instrument to try to coerce government policy and to obtain preferential treatment for those many economic enterprises. If you're talking about freedom of the press or freedom of expression in Puerto Rico, I invite you to go to Puerto Rico. Have you been there? No, I have not. You haven't been there. It's interesting how you're uh, aware of uh, a very special issue uh, in Puerto Rico without having been there. Harvard but let me, does a good job with it. Let me, let me tell you that if you go there, you will find that there are over six daily newspapers in Puerto Rico. There are over 118 radio stations in Puerto Rico. There are over 14 stations, television stations in Puerto Rico. In terms of access, whereas there was a executive order when we took office limiting information to the press, that executive order was derogated. There cannot be any claims that this administration has not given more information and more opportunities for all the media in Puerto Rico that are during the past five years. And we can, we can document that with facts. So this is not a question of freedom of expression or freedom of the press. I 
challenge you to name one instance where the press, any member of the press, has been limited in the access to information or in their free exercise of their profession. What is true is that you mentioned, for example, that an audit uh, or a, an exam of the tax returns of a Nuevo Dia was ordered. That is true. What you don't know, maybe, is that it was ordered for all corporations that have a gross income of over $10 million. What a Nuevo Dia was, wanted was to be excluded from that investigation. The people of Puerto Rico thought that it would be important that the government was as strict with the indiv individual taxpayers as it was with the major corporations in Puerto Rico. So I ask you, is it fair then to call for a tax investigation of all corporations having income above a certain level and exclude one newspaper, because the other newspapers are also included, or the other corporations are also included? That, for me, would be totally inappropriate. The Nuevo Dia has other corporations that have economic activity in Puerto Rico. I was elected to apply the law equally to everyone. I do not think it is appropriate that the newspaper is used as an instrument to coerce and to intimidate government in applying the laws equally to everyone. So if you go down to Puerto Rico, and I invite you to do it, you go there and see if there's any restriction on freedom of information. You will find that possibly per square mile, possibly per citizen, per capita, you will find more media, more news available to our population than almost anywhere in the world. So the information you got, you got honestly, but I must say is one-sided. And I must uh, say that this is at a stage that I welcome because it's now at a court level, at a court level that allows both sides to present their evidence before the people of Puerto Rico who will be the judge of what this is all about. Is this about freedom of the press or is this, this about coercion of the government of Puerto Rico by an enterprise that happens to have an interest in the press. Thank you. Yes. My name is Carmen Chico Duffy. Um, I'm from here, from Massachusetts. Why have both political parties acknowledged that the 3.8 million United States citizens in Puerto Rico should have a right to, delega to delegates to the national conventions every four years, 58 for the Democrats and 16 for the Republicans, to vote on important matters, including selecting party nominees for president and vice president. Yet, after 100 years, the 3.8 million <coughs> residents of Puerto Rico still have no say in decisions impacting their life because they cannot vote for president or for voting representative in the U.S. Senate or House of Representatives? I think the, the reason, the, the, the practical reason, is that uh, the decisions on who votes at the national conventions for the political parties is basically a party decision. Uh, it does not involve the right or absence of such a right of the citizen to vote on an election. And uh, it's basically based on a decision that's made by the political party. As you say, both the Republican and Democratic Party allow Puerto Ricans delegate to participate. At the same time, we elect groups of delegates that are committed to one or another of the candidates for national elections. But when the time comes to vote, Puerto Rico has no chance to vote. This is one of the inconsistencies that we see in Puerto Rico under the current status. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yes. 
Yes, uh, I want to ask the governor in Can terms you of. Yourself, please? My name is Lorenzo Antonio Rosello, and I am from uh, the my National cousin. Committee. No, <laughs> at all. At all. Right. all. I'm from the National Committee to Free Puerto Rican Prisoners of War and Political Prisoners, 15 who are jailed in the United States right yeah. now. Yeah. And uh, the question I have is around how can you speak, I have two parts, of self-determination without the transfer of sovereignty to the Puerto Rican people and the withdrawal of U.S. troops from the island. How do you talk about that self-determination without, and, and colonialism without independence? I, I cannot understand that, and there's a second part. <clears throat> How can you talk about a bilingual country when Paisan here is throwing out the bilingual coordinators and bilingualism here is being attacked in the United States? We live racism and we live discrimination here and segregation in the United States. We live the statehood. What? You have a choice. You can go back to Puerto Rico. <laughs> where, the, where the racist young will rule, where the racist young will rule me? No. Doesn't change. Don't change. There's. Young is a racist, and he rules over Puerto Rico. There, there's. There's racism in the United States. There's racism in Puerto Rico. There's racism throughout the world. That does not validate what you're saying. If you were so committed. If you felt that this racism you're experiencing here is so overwhelming, again, you have a choice. You have a choice. The fact that you're not exercising it is very eloquent as to the reasons for that. And so I think that the people of Puerto Rico have a choice, should make a choice. It might be your choice. It probably won't be. But they have the right, irrespective of how you feel that you've been discriminated or not discriminated. The people that live in Puerto Rico don't have the rights that you have here now. Whether you want to exercise them or not, they don't have them. If you want, you can vote here. The people of Puerto Rico cannot do that. And so, if you're so adamant about that, go back, fight for your ideals, do it there where you can feel what it is to be disenfranchised. Do it there in Puerto Rico. My name is Jack Duffy. I'm a graduate of the school, and I'm married to, a, to Carmen Anachico uh, from Puerto Rico. And uh, I'm tre treasurer of the Massachusetts Commission for Puerto Rican Statehood. My question is, um, I'd like you, Governor, if you could, to please respond to a contradiction. On the one hand, I understand that you have a remarkable academic and professional background, that fellow governors you have worked with for five years have voted you president of the Southern Governors Association, president of the Democratic Governors Association, president of the Council of State Governments. And then in the past two elections, you have been elected governor by large margins by the voters of Puerto Rico, who know you and your convictions well. And your statehood party has won large majorities in both houses of the legislature in Puerto Rico. Yet, a sizable, organized clique here seem to imply that they, not you, understand and represent the real wishes and interests of the Puerto Rican people. Would you please explain this apparent contradiction? Well, I think you used the right words. It's an apparent contradiction. In a democratic system where minority views are respected. There's no question that the majority 
decides the course to be taken. And I think it is very clear from the expression of the Puerto Rican people, expression which I think is very valid because in Puerto Rico, election after election, 85% of our registered voters vote, the highest percentage anywhere in the nation. And that's out of 97% of voters, eligible voters are registered. So for me, it's very simple. For me, it's very simple. The people of Puerto Rico speak, and they do so at least every four years. Whatever the people of Puerto Rico decide, that's what has to be done. If the people of Puerto Rico in this referendum want to take the option of independence, I have no quarrel with that. The quarrel that I have is, as, as you say, a small group represents the interest of the people of Puerto Rico as their own. That is not the democratic way. And if I am willing to accept whatever the will of the people of Puerto Rico is, but I must say that I feel strongly that I represent the wishes and the mandate of the people of Puerto Rico who knew exactly what we would do as an administration when they elected us in 1992 and when they re-elected us with more votes in 1996. Bienvenido, señor gobernador. Uh, my name is Cesar Martinez. I'm a resident of a suburban area around Boston. And um, I had three, four questions, but they seem to have been asked. So assuming, assuming that Puerto Rico is a, the uh, oldest colony in the world, assuming then that the referendum has to do with sovereignty, could you please tell us what kind of power the residents of the island what kind of sovereignty they will get in terms of the representation in the Congress? Well, <clears throat> again, the options are very clear. And I think you've addressed and uh, characterized it with the right word, sovereignty. We have to understand that this is about what kind of sovereignty we want for Puerto Rico. It could be a separate sovereignty, and in that respect, Puerto Rico could be a republic, separate from the United States, and it would have its own representation in its own democratic institution. Or it could be the shared sovereignty of a state under the U.S. Constitution. And under that Constitution, all states, all states, no matter if it's the first state or the last state, all states have equal rights. And so Puerto Rico would come in with all those rights of the shared sovereignty of statehood. That includes full participation in Congress. Specifically for Puerto Rico, that would mean the two senators. It would mean the six or seven congresspersons that we would have by population, and I must say that's over. That's a delegation that's bigger than 25 states, actually. And it would also mean that Puerto Rico could have full participation in all federal programs, and full exercise of the rights, including, including the right to determine what its official language or languages would be. The same right that 20 states have exercised now to establish English as their official language in the state, that same right would belong to Puerto Rico to establish Spanish and English, as it is now, as the official languages. So in summary, Puerto Rico would come in with all the rights and privileges afforded to any other, other states, no matter that we would come in as the 51st state in the same manner that Hawaii as the 50th state or Alaska as a 49th state acquired when they transitioned from territory to states. Thank you. Good evening, Governor. My name is Argentina Arias. I live in Framingham, Massachusetts. I was born in Arroyo, Puerto Rico. Arroyo. And my question is, uh, can you explain why do you believe that statehood will be the best thing for Puerto Rico? 
Well, <clears throat> that's, that's, that's really simple and could be complex, but I'll give you the very simple answer. I feel that Puerto Rico should have equal participation. Not special, not unique, not better, equal participation. It makes no sense to me that you are a part of a system and are not able to participate equally. Within that, I think there are two valid options. Puerto Rico could be a state with equal participation with the rest of the United States citizens, as we are. Puerto Rico could choose to be independent, an independent nation could do that too. For me, the defining factor in this choice is what will happen to the people, what will happen to the individual that lives in Puerto Rico, to the individual citizen. How will his quality of life be better? And I must say that I believe that in those two alternatives, there's no question that the Puerto Rican will be better off under statehood than under independence. What is totally unacceptable to me is that we continue to be a part of a system in which we do not participate fully. So now is the time, now is the time, after 100 years, now is the time to decide. And for me, two options. The best one is statehood because it represents the highest aspirations for the quality of life of our people. Hi, Priscilla from Guaynabo, Puerto Rico. I've been here 13 years, so I welcome you. Thank you. Um, I have a few questions, but only one. For the last two elections, uh, the statehood party has won overwhelmingly the majority, the governorship, resident commissioner, the House and Senate, the majority of municipalities. You know, what is this saying? Do people want, you know, statehood? Or what, it, what does this mean? If you can tell well, I, I think that um, we should be careful in separating the electoral event mm -hmm. and what it means. I could not project that the elections mean a direct support for statehood mm -hmm. because that was not presented in the ballot. Okay. But the people of Puerto Rico knew clearly it was written in plain language that our administration would pursue what we feel is the best future for Puerto Rico, which is statehood. The people of Puerto Rico knew, because it's in black and white, what we would do to foster the opportunity of Puerto Rico to decide finally on its political status option. That is no secret. The fact that we were giving a mandate in 1992 and that was followed by a bigger mandate in 1996, reaffirms to me that we are in the right course in allowing the people of Puerto Rico to choose. I must say that I cannot translate the results of the election into a status choice. What I can do is translate that as a mandate to have the people of Puerto Rico the opportunity to choose. And that's exactly what I'm doing. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're just going to take one more formal question, and then if the governor's willing, he'll take some informal questions from people who want to stay for a few minutes, but this will be the last question of the formal event. Yes, sir. Viva Puerto Rico Libre. My name is Silberto Diaz, a member of Latinos for Social Change. Uh, I haven't had the good fortune of uh, being able to be a physician or go to Harvard, so please forgive my Spanglish. Uh, You know, there's many questions that I'd like to ask the governor, but the fact is, is that uh, U.S. citizenship was imposed on Puerto Rico 
1917, he makes a face, you should know your history. But the Puerto Rican legislator voted in 1917 against U.S. citizenship. The United States government imposed it. Uh, it's important that this audience understand that. Also, excuse me, I, sir, I'm going to ask time a for question. question but, I'm going to ask a question, please. But, but let's not respect. after a long speech. For, okay. Ask the question, let, please. But let me get to my point, please. Uh, if they have criminalized the struggle for independence. He talks about invasion in 1898, the governor. He talks about colonialism. There's a resolution 1514 in the United Nations which has declared that every colonial country has the right to self-determination and can use any means at, available to them to fight for independence. There's currently 14 political, political, uh, political prisoners in right, jail. Excuse me. Excuse me. No, excuse me. I think you've made a statement. Why don't we let the governor comment on your statement? Well, you I really don't have though. a question. I haven't finished. I no, want you to also comment that, but on the you're fact not that not your place to me. make a speech. Well, he's he's saying not your place finish. to make a speech. Okay. He, in terms of the so-called what is the question? The other what uh, is the compañero, question, the question sir? in terms of why doesn't he what return the to the island? The fact is that sixty what percent is your question, of sir? Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico live off of food stamps. Thirteen percent of the island are occupied by U.S. military bases. Okay, that is the reality of Puerto Rico. And we do live racism here, police brutality, unemployment. Okay, go back. Why, why, aren't, why are we here? Those who say go back. So we could be among the food stamps, the, the other 60% that receive food stamps? That is the reality. I think unemployment we have, this, I think we have the sense. If that was the reality here, I, that sir, would be considered depression. So I don't want to call security, but if you could, I think we have the gist again. of what you're saying. I think you have Puerto Rico Libre, and I his administration is nothing but a cloning government representing U.S. corporations in Puerto Rico. Thank you very much, sir. I must commend the uh, compañero. He, uh, he has a better English than I do. And the fact of the matter is, if you're so sure that the people of Puerto Rico would opt for independence, it's very simple. After Let's. Years of colonialism, persecution well, was bad. Well, I, compañero. Okay, I I let you talk. You're giving an, an excellent example of what you would have imposed on the people of Puerto Rico. I have nothing more to say. Thank you. you have the last word. Governor. Thank you for an extraordinary speech and discussion. I think we get some sense of the intensity of feelings that swirl around this issue. And uh, let me say personally, I think the people of Puerto Rico are very fortunate to have you as their governor.